My name is San Jacob Tan. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York, and today's video is on the subject of atrial fibrillation. This video is entitled Strokes in AF Who is the Real Daddy? <laughs> okay, it'll all, it'll all become clear soon. I'll talk you through it. Atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm disturbance in the world, and it can not only cause very unsettling symptoms but can also increase the patient's risk of strokes. All the literature points to the fact that atrial fibrillation can increase the risk of strokes by five times. Now, the traditional thinking has been that when a person goes into atrial fibrillation, the atria stop contracting and therefore blood which would ordinarily be ejected from the atria into the ventricles is more likely to stagnate and therefore clot and this clot can sit within a, a beak-shaped structure within the atria. This is otherwise known as the left atrial appendage. And someday this clot can get dislodged and travel out of the heart to either the brain, where it can cause a stroke, or to somewhere else in the body to cause what is known as a peripheral embolism. This hypothesis, therefore, has been the cornerstone of modern-day management of AF, uh, where the detection of AF automatically triggers the question of whether the patient should start on anticoagulant therapy. The idea is that if we can prevent clot from forming when the blood is stagnant, then we could reduce the risk of stroke. This strategy has been proven to be effective because studies suggest that by starting anticoagulant therapy in patients who are older and have comorbidities and present with AF, we can reduce the risk by about 60%. However, Observations from several studies over the last 20 years have questioned this hypothesis. Now, as per this hypothesis, it would seem logical to assume that if AF causes stagnation of blood and that then leads to clots, i.e. if AF is the parent or daddy of strokes, then taking away the AF would stop the strokes happening because now the blood would not stagnate and therefore no further clots would form. However, in reality, this has not proven to be the case. There were two big studies called RACE, R-A-C-E, and AFFIRM, A-F-F-I-R-M. If you type these in Google, they'll come up, which both show that controlling the rhythm, i.e. taking away the AF, did not appear to take away the strokes, i.e. patients continued to have strokes even when the AF had been taken away. If we think about this hypothesis again, it would again seem logical to think that if AF were the parent of strokes, then surely there should be a temporal relationship between the AF and the stroke, i.e. you would expect the risk of strokes to be much greater within a certain time period from the appearance of AF. Again, this has not been shown. There was a very interesting study called ASSERT, A-S-S-E-R-T. This study looked at 2,580 patients with heart monitors um, or pacemakers, and the advantage of these is that they can detect even small episodes of even silent AF. And in this study, they found that only 8% of patients who had had strokes had any AF within 30 days of the stroke. And in 16% of patients, actually the first AF episode occurred after the stroke. So again, if AF were the daddy of strokes, then surely it would have to precede the stroke, which it doesn't seem to do on many occasions. Another um, point to make is that if AF were the cause of strokes, then we would surely expect that the more the AF, the higher the risk. Yet again, we fail to see a consistent relationship between the duration of AF or even the permanence of AF or even the rate of AF and strokes. In fact, all the risk markers for stroke are to do with the patient's age and comorbidities rather than with how much or how little AF the patient is getting. Another interesting observation is that when you take young healthy people with AF, they seem to tolerate it very badly. They don't like it, they get really troublesome symptoms, but they don't tend to have strokes. Whereas if you take older, sicker patients, some of them don't even know they're in AF, yet they seem to be at a much higher risk of strokes. Again, same AF, but very different stroke risk. That again does not fit.
So based on all these observations, we have to rethink this hypothesis. Surely, if we were sitting in a paternity lawsuit, it would be difficult to condemn AF as being guilty of being the father of strokes. Yes, AF and strokes do seem to happen or be in the same places, but that's about it. There does not appear to be any convincing evidence that AF causes the stroke. So the question then is, if AF is not the daddy of strokes, then who is the real daddy? Okay, so <laughs> to understand the answer, we have to realize that we've been making a false assumption all this time. We have been assuming that because someone is in AF, their atria are not working, and that is correct. But the incorrect assumption we have been making is that if a person is in sinus rhythm, that means that their atria are working fine. Actually, it is quite possible that you can have weak atria, which are not pumping much blood into the ventricle and therefore causing stagnation of blood, and that can then lead to the blood clot without the patient being in atrial fibrillation, i.e. the atria may have lost most of their mechanical function before they start fibrillating. We see this in the ventricle. The ventricle can fibrillate, but when it does, it heralds immediate impending death because we know that the ventricle at that point is not pushing any blood out. However, just because a person is not in ventricular fibrillation does not mean that the ventricle is always mechanically pumping out lots of blood. People can have very weak ventricles and yet remain in sinus rhythm. These patients are termed as having heart failure and there are lots and lots and lots of such patients around who are in sinus rhythm but have very weak ventricles. And interestingly, as the ventricle gets weaker, we see a greater incidence of clots within the ventricle. And these clots can also be dislodged and cause strokes. And so now scientists are now beginning to think that it is perhaps a weak atrium which is the real daddy of strokes rather than a fibrillating atrium. A weak atrium could harbor a clot, which could then be dislodged, and a weak atrium can also fibrillate as and when, and this would explain nicely the lack of temporal relationship between atrial fibrillation and stroke. A weak atrium can cause the clot, a weak atrium can fibrillate, but there may not necessarily be a temporal relationship between the fibrillation and the strokes. We have now started referring to weak atria as atrial myopathy. And it is my belief that the true daddy of strokes is atrial myopathy, not atrial fibrillation. Let's explore this a little further. The atria are usually the thinnest parts of the heart. The wall thickness of the atria is anything between one millimeter and four millimeter at most. Compare this with the ventricles, which are usually eight to 10 millimeters thick. Whenever the heart is under any kind of stress, the atria, on account of their walls being so thin, are most likely to take the brunt of this added stress or pressure. Now, I'll give you an analogy. Imagine taking a hose pipe and cutting it in the middle, okay? And then take a balloon and cut it at both ends and put the ballooning material to bridge the gap between the two bits of the hose pipe. So you have hose pipe, thick, then balloon, thin, then hose pipe, okay? And connect it to a tap. And then what you do is when the tap starts running, you press on the end of the hose pipe. And what you will see at that point is that the balloon, the rubber of the balloon will start inflating. And that is because it's the thinnest part of that system. And therefore it's going to dilate when the pressure within the system goes up. And this is the same with the atria. So as we get older and develop comorbidities such as high blood pressure, vascular disease, diabetes, chronic inflammation, etc., the end result is that the work the heart has to do to get the blood out is increased. And this extra stress is felt most by the atria and over a period of time the atria starts stretching and much like a rubber band that is stretched too hard, the atria start losing their elasticity and therefore their power. And this process is called atrial myopathy. So all the risk factors that increase the risk of strokes seem to be those that increase the likelihood of atrial myopathy, which fits very nicely with why these things increase the risk of strokes and not the AF per se. This would also explain why young healthy people feel their AF really badly, 
but actually don't seem to have more strokes compared to the older people who don't feel the AF, but do seem to have much higher risk of strokes. The young, healthy people have strong atria. They don't have atrial myopathy. And if in them, suddenly, they lose atrial function for whatever reason, they really feel it. On the other hand, the older patients have already lost atrial function long before they even go into AF. So when they go into AF, they don't really feel any different because their bodies have adapted to the loss of atrial function over time. Okay, so is there any evidence that confirms that perhaps it is atrial myopathy that is the daddy of strokes and not AF? For this, we have to identify ways of diagnosing atrial myopathy and most of the methods are still mainly used for research rather than in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Atrial weakness is likely to cause atrial irritability. So people with atrial myopathy may be more likely to have atrial premature beats or atrial tachycardia or other non-AF dysrhythmias. And there are some clinical studies that have suggested that these minor irritabilities in the right subset of patients, i.e. patients with advanced age or patients with comorbidities are also associated with an increased risk of strokes independent of diagnosed AF. And this was published by a guy called Larson et al. in the American Journal of Cardiology in 2015. Another thing we could do to look for atrial myopathy is we could study the electrical activity through the atrium to see if this would give us some clue about the atrial muscle. This can be done by a technique called atrial echocardiography. And scientists have identified that the P wave terminal force in lead V1 on an ECG can identify atrial myopathy. Remember, in AF there are no P waves, but in atrial myopathy there will be P waves, so you can look at those P waves. Uh, and people have said that if you get this kind of P wave terminal force, which is uh, more um, obvious in V1, then that can be a sign of atrial myopathy. And there was a study which showed that this finding was associated with a higher risk of strokes, again, independent of AF. Another thing which we can pick up easily in routine practice is left atrial size. And usually an enlarged left atrium is often a marker of a stressed left atrium. And then there are lots of studies that have suggested that an, that an enlarged left atrium in the absence of any AF in patients who are older and have comorbidities have a higher incidence of strokes. Finally, we have MRI scanning of the heart and the advantage MRI scanning has over most other modalities is that it allows you to study tissue in more detail. And it's very good for looking for fibrosis, which tends to happen in any tissue which is exposed to excessive wear and tear. And studies have suggested that the more the fibrosis in the atria on MRI, the higher the risk of strokes. So one other thing you can look for is BNP. BNP is a compound that can be picked up in the blood. It's, it can be measured through a blood test. BNP is released when the atria are stretched. So when the atria are having to work against a higher pressure, they stretch. This releases a compound called BNP. And BNP has this effect of causing us to pass more urine to try and reduce some of the stress in the system. Imagine putting your foot on that hose pipe, the balloon stretches and the balloon releases something which allows more fluid from the system to leak out to reduce the pressure. And again, there is a lot of evidence that people with higher BNPs uh, could probably be at a higher risk of strokes, even if their left ventricular function and everything else looks okay, uh, that could uh, be a marker of a higher risk of strokes. So you can see that it is very likely that the true daddy is atrial myopathy and not atrial fibrillation. And as our understanding of this process increases, it may allow us to be more sophisticated about who we should anticoagulate, who we shouldn't. It may allow us to be more sophisticated for not waiting for atrial fibrillation to develop before we decide who we should anticoagulate because the problem with atrial fibrillation is it can be silent, it can be very difficult to pick up, and the patient may be at a higher risk of strokes anyway. So far better to start looking for things like atrial myopathy and working on whether that is a reliable indicator of a higher risk of strokes. And we need studies, we need big studies to confirm that, uh, but I suspect that they will come and uh, 
it will change how we decide how to anticoagulate patients and who to anticoagulate. So I hope you found this useful. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on whether you agree that atrial myopathy is the true daddy of strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. Once again, thank you so much for all that you do for me. All the best. Bye.